Welcome to the third Sunday after Trinity. Through the Sundays in Trinity, I'm reflecting on what it means to be a follower of the way. That's the name Christians had before they were nicknamed Christian. I'm reflecting from the Old Testament reading set for the day, which is never a popular choice, so all the more reason to choose it. It's time to get to grips with the fact that the Bible is one book authored by one spirit, the Spirit of God, and it features one hero, Jesus, from beginning to end. Today I'm reading and reflecting in the very place that Jeremiah had such trouble, Jerusalem. So, here we go, and it's a heart-rending window into his personal world. Jeremiah, chapter 20, beginning at verse 7. It's a lament. You deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out, proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say, I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name. His word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. I hear many whispering, terror on every side. Denounce him, let's denounce him. All my friends are waiting for me to slip, saying, Perhaps he will be deceived. Then we will prevail over him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior, so my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will fail and be thoroughly disgraced. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. Lord Almighty, you who examine the righteous and probe the heart and mind, let me see your vengeance on them, for to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. It's desperate, isn't it? That someone should want us not to remember his birthday. He wish he'd never been born. But we're thinking about God's peace, walking in God's peace. Well, I'm thinking about an incident at home. So there I was, outside in the cool of the day, pruning the roses, watering the pots, spraying the green fly. Suddenly there was an ominously loud noise from three people walking down the street shouting at each other. Now a short street is a throughway, but it's a quiet throughway on the whole. People just walk up to it, up it, to go to the shops from the car park. So the person shouting catches sight of me and comes across to give me a bit of an apology, actually. We talk about the fact that she's lost her mum and what life has done to her, and all I can say to the two who've been shouting to someone else who's disappeared up the street towards town, why don't you just come and smell one of my roses, because it will make you feel calmer. It's just a little ordinary conversation to diffuse the sense of heightened tension. And I say, life happens to people, and let me give you one of my roses, because I'd like to. Well, she chooses a white Margaret Merrill, a white reminder of her mum. I say, well, the petals might drop, but you're welcome to it. It's very fragrant. Would you like a yellow one? She says that a yellow one reminds her of the sun she's lost. And the point of telling this story is there wasn't much peace in her life. And certainly there wasn't much peace in our street. And there isn't much peace in the world. And that's a pointless thing to say, really. It's self-evident. So when we talk about walking in God's peace, we're actually talking about something which is pretty counterculture to most of the world's experience. And in case we think the restlessness is only abroad, the UK is troubled in many different directions. And this part of the world, where I am now, even this place where I'm recording, ironically is called a city of peace, Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, Salam, Shalom, there. There will never be peace here, this side of Jesus' return. When we get to reading Jeremiah, we discover that here is God's man, but he doesn't seem to have much peace either. 
His story was pretty grim. He was the only prophet who told the leadership to go with the flow as the threat of Babylonian invasion increased. But when he did, he was shouted down and silenced. All the other state prophets were saying, oh, we're okay. We've got the temple, so we'll be all right. We're, we're God's people. He won't let us down. Jeremiah said, no, that's not how it's going to work. Go with the flow, because actually the Babylonians are being used by God to discipline you, and it's going to be something you have to submit to. Believe me, chaps. So they did all sorts of things to him because they didn't like his pitch. They cut up his words, words he'd written down in a sort of public ceremony, cutting the scroll into strips and burning it strip by strip. They put him down a pit. He was only rescued because a friend came to help him. It was bad enough for him to not want to have to have been born. And then the time came. And Babylon invaded and carried most of them away, thus vindicating the divine authority of his message. Jeremiah was left behind with a ragtag bunch of individuals and he would have had every right to say, I told you so. But he didn't. Just like God doesn't. We visited the Holocaust Museum yesterday. It put a whole new meaning to the word lament. This is a lament. Of all the prophets in the whole of the Old Testament, I think Jeremiah, known as the weeping prophet, with his sequel, Lamentations, echoes the heartbeat of God most accurately. For those who think that the God of the Old Testament is an angry God, read Jeremiah. Remember that what sounds like anger is the other side of the same coin of as love. Anger and love are two sides of the same coin. It was never self-defensive, disproportionate anger. It was a lament that was in the heart of God, most of the Old Testament. But if Jeremiah thinks he's been dealt a duff deal by God. He's got this task of speaking God's word and he can't not speak it. Every time he tries not to speak God's word, he says, it's like my bones burned inside me. I've got to do it. Even though it gets me into such trouble. I don't see a man enjoying God's peace here until the end of the reading. Now, we mustn't whitewash Bible characters and make them less than human, or see them as ancient people who have no emotions or no reactions to the grotty circumstances they're suffering. Jeremiah is at the end of his tether. And yet, he makes this striking comment that he's not alone in any of it. Although he reacts as if God has sent it, he knows he hasn't. On the contrary, God is with him in it. But that doesn't stop him being honest. There's a blend of honesty and humility in Jeremiah's relationship with God that brings him peace. He doesn't push how he feels under the carpet or pretend things aren't happening. He doesn't have a saintly smile painted on his face in the pretense that he's trusting God. On the contrary, he truly is trusting God, and that's why he can be honest. This is typical of the classic lament. You will hear David, the singer-songwriter king, pouring out his heart before God in that healthy blend of honesty and humility. David often sings, in the Lord I have taken refuge, chased by Saul. He's hiding in a cave, a place of refuge. He starts with complete honesty about the circumstances and his enemies, and he may even call for revenge. But there's always that final parting shot in the poem 
that reflects his trust in God. God, you can see everything and will require justice at some stage in the scheme of things. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, friends of Daniel, are sentenced to the fiery furnace for refusing to bow down in worship of the statue of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And everyone's amazed when they come out unharmed and their testimony is a fourth figure walked with us. Daniel himself gets thrown into a den of lions. You know that story. Peter and Paul and Silas get thrown into prison. What peace can they possibly have had? A good deal of apprehension, I would have said. Even if we know we've made a mistake, the peace of God is his presence in the eye of the storm, his mercy in the middle of the fiery furnace, facing the lions, in the darkness of the cave, and down the pit. Because God is gracious. To understand that God has a bird's eye view on everything that happens, that I and my case are not forgotten, that I don't have to fight my corner or thrash about injustice, that brings peace. When Jesus said, my peace I give to you, he was just about to face his own agonising death on the cross. So it's not that the circumstances are going to change, or that there is an absence of stress or absence of war or absence of conflict or a calm, tranquil, lakeside type peace. It's that peace is handing it all over to God who can take it on board. It's laying stuff down before God. Sometimes I think we are honest with God, but we have to make sure we aren't just warming to our theme. Our honesty has to move through at some stage to humility. Knowing that we're friends with God means that we are not restless. Restlessness is the antipathy of peace. The word rest is such a beautiful word. It's to do with security and safety. It's to do with Sabbath rest, when God rested after the business of creation. Hebrews talks about Sabbath rest. That those who believe in Jesus have rest of heart despite circumstances. Why? Because we know God is good, God is sovereign, and we are forgiven. These are the things that bring security and rest to our hearts. Although we may get ruffled, or we might panic at our circumstances, there has to be that undertow of security that God is there, he is sovereign, he is good, and he is our rest. Thank you.
God our Saviour, look on this wounded world in pity and in power. Hold us fast to your promises of peace, won for us by your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Bye.